I represent the GSMA Mobile for Development Impact Program. And we offer open data analysis and insights on mobile and emerging markets to inform design decisions, uh, investment decisions, and to support digital inclusion. And we offer this information for free at our very newly redesigned portal, which is m4dimpact.com. And here you can find um, a variety of information, including an overview of which network operators uh, work in each country uh, and their network coverage, where that's available. We offer trackers showing what M4D products and services are available in each market. We uh, link out to national statistics, which are taken from leading development organizations uh, to show the social needs in each market. And we offer groundbreaking research and analysis. And one of our most recent pieces of research, delivered in collaboration with Midia Network and Vital Wave, is on or under your seats today. And that uh, highlights the commercial and social potential of connecting mobile entrepreneurs in emerging markets with the vast networks, uh, mentorship, and funding opportunities in developed world hubs such as Silicon Valley. And this really helps frame our discussion today. For these are very promising times for entrepreneurs in emerging markets. Um, as our online trackers shows, and as all of you are no doubt aware, because you're in this room today, um, launching new mobile products and services in emerging markets has never been faster or cheaper. Um, we've got mo rising mobile device penetration, and with that, uh, a growing pool of digitally savvy, connected consumers. And across the developing world, product and service developers who have fast internet connections, who have good ideas, they're responding to market pain points, and they're driving innovation with new mobile products, services, and applications. And these entrepreneurs are ambitious people. They want to disrupt markets, and they want to change existing systems. But while launching a new mobile product or service uh, is easier than ever, scaling one is not. And this is what my panelists are here to talk about today. Um, allow me to introduce Dylan Higgins from uh, Copo Copo. We've got Andy Friedman, uh, Managing Director at Mabenzi. And we've got Alpesh Patel, Group CEO at My Group International Limited. Um, what I'm going to do is ask each panelist to introduce themselves and their company, share a little bit about what scale means to them. I'm going to then ask a few of my questions before opening out to to enable you to ask some of yours. So please get thinking about what those questions are and we'll come running with a microphone shortly. Um, Dylan, would you kick us off, please? Excellent. Thanks for inviting me. And thank you, everyone, for attending this, this seminar. Um, good afternoon. My name is Dylan Higgins. I am the CEO of Copo Copo. We are a fintech platform that seeks to digitize a million plus businesses through electronic payments. So scale for us is businesses in the emerging markets using our platform to digitize their business. And we also uh, have a key entry point into our relationship with the business, and we'll talk about this during the, the, the session, which is we see the, the beginning point being electronic payments. If we can start moving their cash payments to electronic payments, we can then bridge that digital divide across a number of different products, marketing, financial services, et cetera. But we prefer to start with the electronic payment value proposition as the means to start that relationship with the, the business and then obviously scale that relationship across many, many businesses, across many, many markets. Thank you. Andy. Thanks, Julia. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm from a company called Mobenzi. Um, we're out of South Africa. Um, the place I grew up the native language or the indigenous language is Zulu. And uh, we came up with our name by combining the words mobile and umsebenzi, which means work. So um, the premise of our company or the philosophy of our company is ready to look at how we can uh, scale or magnify the impact of social initiatives through the use of appropriate technologies um, and innovative business models. So appropriate technologies is the key for us. It's about looking at how do we combine the different technologies that are already available be they mobile apps, SMS, USSD, push notifications, uh, IVR, etc. How do we combine those and structure them in a fashion that they become um, a magnifier or an amplifier of social impact? 
Um, so we, the way we work is that we partner with organizations both in the public and the private sector. So we would work with a Department of Health or we'd work with a Department of Education. And we work with organizations that put the frontline worker at the forefront uh, of, this, of, the, of the initiative. So for us, scale really comes about through empowering that frontline worker, be it a, a community health worker or a teacher or an agriculture extension officer. And through empowering that frontline worker, uh, we can reach a large number of people. Um, so our technology is geared towards enabling those people or empowering those people uh, to perform their jobs better uh, and for them to have that impact that we hope those interventions will have. Um, for me, an interesting thing that came about in, in our journey was when we sat down with a community health worker and we said to her, what do you like most about the technology? And I was expecting it would be some feature or, or some app that she'd been using. But for her, for her what she said to us, it, it was something that gave her respect within the community. And for, the, for me, that was quite a pointed moment in terms of framing what we're actually dealing with here and what technology, the role that technology can play. So our technology is in about 40 countries right now. Um, but when we talk about scale, uh, it depends a little bit on, on who the frontline worker is and what her role is. But if we're dealing with a community health worker, for example, um, a community health worker will typically be assigned about 250 households or around about 1,000 clients, uh, patients. So if we can empower 1,000 community health workers, we're going to touch the lives of a million people in a very real way. Um, so our, one of our deployments is in South Africa um, with community health workers where we have about 600 community health workers. Uh, and so that's touching the lives of about 600,000 uh, individuals there. So scale for us really is about how can we saturate a specific, say, sub-district or province or region uh, to the extent where we get critical mass within the intervention that we're dealing with. So that would be the definition of, of scale for us. Uh, it would be around establishing critical mass such that the intervention is self-sustaining. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Alpesh. I'm the founder of a company called MyPhone, which is the first mobile African mobile device brand. It was set up. We're actually entering our seventh year. Uh, we're not a major player. Um, we're not trying to be the biggest, but we're trying to get better every day. And it's uh, it's a hundred percent African-owned company, which I set up uh, when I left Motorola. And I figured out that you know the big brands are doing some really good things, but the big brands were missing out on a lot of things, especially at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, so six years ago, we, we set up basically Africa's first mobile devices brand. The, uh, the journey has been tough. Uh, we're completely self-funded. We have not raised a penny in private equity or VC. So living proof that you can have a startup in Africa that goes on to early growth stage with zero funding as long as you know the markets. So today we're in uh, uh, several markets. Our focus is uh, East Africa, Kenya. Uh, our, one of our biggest markets is Angola. Um, but we cannot compete with the big guys. So we're a field, we're a David in the field of 25 Goliaths. So innovation is, is, the, is at the, the heart of our business. Um, one of the first things we did to put ourselves on the map is we introduced the My Obama phone, which was the phone that we did when Obama was announced as president. And that got us a lot of um, uh, mileage in terms of publicity. So we were very good to piggyback on, on what was hot at the time. Over the last few years, we've realized that, look, I've, you may give me $10 million, but Samsung's got $200 million. If, they put up a, if I put up a billboard, they're going to put up 20. So innovation is really, really important uh, for us. And being small, being um, very tightly funded, we're very uh, innovative with our money. And we make sure we stretch every dollar. One of the ways we've, we've tried to elevate our game is uh, we've introduced um, uh, Africa's, one of Africa's first prepaid debit cards that comes free with every smartphone we're going to sell in Kenya. So this way you start empowering the users of the phones um, by giving them a mobile wallet with a card, but the card is a cash-out solution. So you've got a lot of mobile wallets all over the continent, but very few cash-out solutions. Now, this card engages the user. Um, the user can get rewards. And this way, we feel that we can build our brand via emotional attachment. Um, one thing we're really proud of is our second innovation after, after my phone is um, we just developed and introduced the world's first black smileys. Okay, now this is revolutionary. Why? Because it's so simple, no one's ever thought of it, but we thought of it about a year ago. Uh, and this, my phone is our offering to Africa. Oju is our offering to the world. Uh, it's going to address the lack of diversity that exists in digital language today. And Oju is, actually means faces in the Yoruba language of Nigeria. And it's Africa's first digital character brand that's going to be on every platform globally. And we believe that then, you know, 
people can start empowering themselves by having some kind of representation. So there is a social message behind what we do. Um, we are in it for the money, I'm not going to lie, but uh, it's called conscious capitalism. We're going to make money, but we're going to do it the right way. And I think that's really important in, in a lot of what we talk about in M4D. We're not just talking about using mobile purely for social impact. It's for commercial gain as well, because we believe that is the only way um, for sustainability in the long run. OK, so maybe you could um, tell us a little bit about, um, now, now we've heard about your, your companies. Um, we've heard what scale means to you. What, what are the barriers to scale, and how can these be overcome? Um, I think there's a lot to talk about here. Maybe Dylan, you could kick us off. Yeah, I mean, I like when I think of barriers to scale. Um, I think it's useful to kind of go back in history a bit. The mobile money industry where we operate is still young, but it's growing fast. And I think it's an, ex an exciting juncture. When we started our journey five years ago, um, I think one of the barriers to um, our business and to scale was the appetite for partnerships with mobile money providers was not even. Ready. Like when we talked with our first um, partner, which is Safaricom, uh, we had to convince them that a small, innovative company, technology company, could scale the business in Kenya. And um, we, it took us a while, it took us a year to get them comfortable with signing a, an aggregator contract, a merchant aggregator contract with us. Um, and then it took us months to build that business. And, and then the numbers came in and they saw the, the and were very, uh, excited with the, the, the market we built and now it's it's just phenomenal how you know, the, when we started there was less than 100 merchants on the M-Pesa platform accepting uh, M-Pesa at the point of sale. Two years later there was 140,000 registered. Um, 100 to 140,000 in two years. So phenomenal growth um, and we like to think that that's because um, M-Pesa made the wise decision to um, explore an appetite for partnerships. Now, I think what's happening now, though, is uh, across the continent and across the global south, you're seeing that appetite, people are thinking about partnerships, but the problem is, and this is the, the hurdle that all of us are, are facing, is the rules of the road are not set. So how do we approach the operator? What are the standards? And the, I think in the previous session, there was a lot of talk about this, is it's not clear uh, what is the pricing model? What is the distribution model? And so each market that we're in, we're now in an additional five markets, and every single time we have to go in and we're starting the conversation again. Now, thankfully, we have sort of a contract. We have proof points we can explain, but it just takes a while. We're, we're educating every single market, as opposed to I would hope that they would, that the operators would have a framework for, that we could use as opposed to us building effectively the framework. Um, so I mean, it gives us a great competitive advantage in that we sort of have our own framework, but for the, the good of the broader entrepreneurial community and the good of the markets, I think that it would make sense for some standardization to uh, be placed in, in the marketplace. I mean, if you think of, um, we're very similar to what uh, merchant acquirers and Visa and MasterCard kind of ecosystems do. Those are 300 page operating rules that, that unfortunately I've read for the Visa operating rules. Now those are not exciting, but they give you the rules of the road. I would like to see something similar for mobile money providers, is the operating rules for entrepreneurs to engage with providers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I think we're in a slightly different environment and, and maybe the, the um, the learnings are slightly different, um, but for what it's worth from our side, everything kind of seems to change at scale. Um, and I think that's partly the problem is that you might build a pilot and it may work very well, but how does that translate into scalability? Um, so when we're dealing with um, frontline workers and talking about scaling solutions to them, suddenly the logistics become quite a big barrier um, when it comes to how do you train hundreds of health workers? Uh, whether it's on the technology, whether it's on their kind of day-to-day -day, um, standard operating procedures. So the logistics around the handset itself, uh, what if something goes wrong? Because now this is becoming like their primary device through which they are you know, screening patients, through the capturing data about them, referring them to clinics. So you have to start looking at a lot of the things which aren't as sexy and as exciting, but which need to get done and checked off so that the, the rest of the solution can flow. Um, so for us, those barriers actually in some way have become a bit of an opportunity. And the reason I say that is because as we came across these barriers or these challenges, we coded solutions to them and embedded that into our platform. So that now others who hopefully need to take their 
um, uh, interventions to scale won't have to reinvent the wheel and duplicate that effort. So it's now a feature on our platform as opposed to saying, you know, how do you manage airtime mismanagement or abuse that a health worker may encounter? How do you stop them from going to Facebook when they should be using their data for capturing patient information? So by building that into our core platform and allowing that kind of restrictions to be put in place, we actually have something that I think makes us uh, more marketable. So those challenges have been there, and it's taken us eight years to figure out a lot of them, and we haven't got there yet with everything, um, but it's definitely uh, helped us in overcoming some of the, and making things robust as we go to scale. Great. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that would be my take on it. Mm. Alpesh, what about you? I've got you? a list of 20. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, as a, as, a, as a small company and, and entrepreneur, um, the biggest challenge obviously is funding. Um, you know, the interest rates we pay to African banks to borrow money is 20%. Um, the big brands they have, they borrow on, on, the, on, the, on the European and Western markets for probably 1%. So we've got to factor that into our costing, and yet we're still cheaper. The other thing is, um, I, think, uh, I think the data, data issue. Yeah. Um, today, for example, no one really knows what is 2 megabyte or 5 megabyte or 10 megabyte. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty well educated. I still don't know what two megabytes buys me. How do we expect an African, average African consumer earning less than $500 a month to understand data packages? There's a lot of education required. So operators are always pushing us to get better handset prices, but what is the operators doing about reducing data costs? Because today, operators are still making massive amounts of EBITDA. They could take some of that EBITDA and make data cheaper so that the customer can get a handset but also have affordable services on that handset. This way, you start getting more mass. So data, I think government regulations, I mean, there's, you know, some countries have duties. Some countries don't have duties. There's a lot of smuggling going on. You know, there's a lot of parallel grade trade. So the consumer is not getting a good deal. Um, and, you know, our mission is to make sure that we constantly just striving to make sure the customer is getting the best deal possible. Great. So, yeah, there's quite a few barriers. Yeah. I think... Dylan, you've got some thoughts on, on data usage. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that Alpesh brought this up because we're actually someone tweeted about this earlier today, and I don't know if this was just in Kenya. It's a, a colleague of ours, um, Shiko, and I'm not sure if she's here, but uh, she tweeted today, and so again, this may be a Kenyan statistic, but less than 50% of smartphone owners actually have data enabled. Um, and I think it's because, in fact, the vendors will say, don't turn your data on because it's going to, it, you're going to run out of time very quickly because people don't aren't educated about what a megabyte is, um, and so I know there's been some um, innovation around pricing by by time as opposed to by by megabyte, mm -hmm. um, and I, th I think that would be phenomenal because that's how they buy um, all consumers, including myself. That's how we buy um, prepaid airtime. Why not buy prepaid internet time? Um, and um, I think that's the kind of innovation that needs to happen in order for um, smartphone usage will lead to uh, rise the levels that we all need and expect it to. Great. Touching on the idea of mentorship um, and connecting with developed world um, hubs that I briefly mentioned in, in my intro, what do you think the potential is there? Do you see a lack of those kinds of opportunities in your markets? And, and if so, what do you think could, could help overcome that? Sorry, the question to connect specifically with uh, of, of developed markets. Yeah. So is, is there a lack of uh, mentorship and networking yes. opportunities? Yes. I think it's rising. I mean, there's a lot of incubators now set up all over Africa. There's a lot of seminars, I mean, leadership seminars, private equity seminars, angel investment seminars. I don't exactly know what exactly happens at the end because mm -hmm. there's a lot of guys with money saying they're looking for good deals and a lot of guys with deals saying they're looking for money. <laughs> but some, sometimes, the, you know, the... Uh, the the private equity guys, for example, they're looking at $50, $100 million deals. But that's not where entrepreneurship starts. Entrepreneurship starts at $10, $100, $200, $1 million, that kind of range. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the biggest challenge we face in Africa is we don't have a Silicon Valley culture. Today, in the US, as a startup, you've got a good idea, you get funded, and big companies embrace you. You get celebrated. In Africa, the big guys buy from big guys. Entrepreneurs, one, two-man shows have a tough time to break through because they don't have the money. And, you know, it's, uh, people don't know if you're going to be around tomorrow. So I think there needs to be a lot more work. And I think the Silicon Valley itself, in terms of tech, can really help Africa. 
my personal, uh, I think we spoke about this as well, and one of my things is try and bridge that gap between Africa and the US in terms of getting African entrepreneurs over there and getting Silicon Valley investors to come and spend some time with us in Africa so they can see, actually, you know what, people are not walking around with the, with, with the animals and spears and things, you know? This is, this, is, uh, this is a continent that is really, really, it's gonna be the big, it's the next big thing. Mm -hmm. For my part, I think um, I think it was Patrick uh, raised a good point on the previous panel, just around um, you know engaging with local entrepreneurs to ensure that the solution that gets deployed or developed is locally relevant, um, and I think that's absolutely critical, and it's quite a, a, a fine balancing act. I think in terms of getting that right, so that yes, you want to look to develop markets for inspiration, for perhaps capital, for um, experience, and you want to adapt that and make it locally relevant. Um, so, I mean, for, for, for our part, um, I think we lean quite heavily on some of the developed market, like core infrastructure, if I can put it that way. Like if you look at something like an Amazon Web Services, which I think a lot of entrepreneurs use to power like their core platforms. Those, you, you unfortunately don't have those nodes within Africa, within the developed market. Um, the reasons for that, we can go into a different panel, but in South Africa, for example, a few power issues from time to time. Um, so, so uh, from that perspective, you do lean on the developed market for powering what is ultimately like a local solution, even though it's using these building blocks which exist overseas. So I think as entrepreneurs within the developing world, we can lean very heavily on what's come before, uh, not necessarily business models so much necessarily, but certainly some of the core infrastructure elements. Um, I also feel like, uh, I mean, the, the GSMA is doing a lot in terms of creating these networks and uh, these, these sort of uh, workshops that we can discuss uh, issues within. So from that perspective, I feel that there, 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 is a, there is quite a lot going on, but certainly there would be room for, for more of that interaction between developing and developed. Yeah, and that's definitely something our research picked up on, the, the fact that local or entrepreneurs in emerging markets, they, they really know the local pain points. And that's really the opportunity for, you know, the big tech guys or the big funders in the developed world. If they want to move into emerging markets, they're going to need that local knowledge. So there's, there's reasons on both sides of the coin here for, for a connection to be made. Dylan, I know you've got um, some thoughts on sort of... No, I, I would echo much apps. of um, what has been said already. As, as a company that has raised money from the Silicon Valley, um, we spend a lot of time educating the Valley about the opportunity. And there is still the perception that um, our... That, I mean, in fact, I had a question just the other day um, because we are raising money right now, and someone said, are you a commercial enterprise? And I, it was a little bit, yes, this is a huge opportunity, and... Um, this, this is not a philanthropic. Is that what they assume? It, yeah, they because assume you were that. Out of yes, Africa. Uh, and so yeah. there is still a lot of that, um, and I think that it's gotten much better. Um, we have raised money twice from Silicon Valley, and when I did this four years ago, uh, it was very hard. But the conversation, and I think GSMA is doing a great job, is changing, and I think that the the size of the commercial opportunity is now a lot more. Investors, VCs are are aware of the size of the opportunity, but um, so I think the funding channels are getting better. I do think there's a gap between very seed money, so less than a million, and then 10 million plus. There, there's a real gap there. Uh, and I, I do think from a mentorship perspective, because that was your original question, I think the, the biggest thing that's not being done, and I'll um, echo Alpesh again, which is I want to see more African entrepreneurs coming to the Valley. Um, mm -hmm. Those Now the VCs and tech entrepreneurs are coming to Africa. It needs to go the other way. Um, and th that's not happening at all right now. Um, I think the, the select few are getting opportunities to go to San Francisco, but, but not enough. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see it go the other, other way. Um, and I, I think that would help a lot of the um, entrepreneurs um, in Africa because they would see that um, the, the beauty of the Silicon Valley is the connections, all of the, par to my original point, partnerships. It's not just one company. You have to partner on so many levels. And I think that a lot of entrepreneurs that I've met out in, in Kenya are very focused on just trying to do it all alone and so aren't thinking about actually hiring a business development person to build the, the partnerships. Yeah. Um, so more African entrepreneurs to the Valley would be a very good thing. Excellent. And so in this ecosystem of partnerships, which either, which is growing, shall we say, let's be optimistic, it, it's, it's yes, becoming. Um, what role should the operators play? We're at Mobile World Congress, it's a pertinent question. Well, I think, like I said, first they've done, and many operators, not all, but many of them are doing the first thing, which is embracing partnerships and recognizing that 
the um, do it all alone approach will not, may work um, quarter to quarter, but will not work um, year to year. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the first step. So I ask, I uh, implore all of the operators in the room um, and beyond to um, recognize the power of partnerships. Just like you've, in the case of mobile money, just you know your voice and data businesses, you do partner. Mobile money, you need to partner as well. Uh, and then I think what the operators can also do is what I what I touched on is is set down some some rules of the road about how uh, they want to engage with the entrepreneurial community to facilitate those discussions, to kickstart them. Now, ultimately, it's going to be a business development discussion, and it's going to be back and forth. You don't have to have you know, a specific template, but you need to have processes and techniques and, and people that entrepreneurs can talk with to engage with operators. And, and there's not, <coughs> frankly, there's very little of that right now. It's still, mm -hmm. you have to just, you have to take the initiative and go find the right people, and um, which is not uncommon, but I think, the operators could do a better job with exposing their partnership models to entrepreneurs. Okay, Alpesh, you're nodding. Would you like to share? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, operators take a long time to get things done in Africa. Um, I know. Um, it takes a long time to get paid. <laughs> um, the problem is that because, again, I go back to the self funding model, um, and maybe just use your, you as an example, you come from Silicon Valley, you've obviously got some funding. I don't know when you started generating your first revenues once you received funding, but most Silicon Valley companies will generate revenue after three years, four years, five years. If I don't generate money tomorrow, I don't pay my bills. In Africa, we have that thing where no one is there to give us a, well, we don't have a cash burn rate. We just burn, right? Because there's no one funding. And entrepreneurs, I mean, our, our businesses take time to succeed. We can't be successful over, we as my phone are not, I don't believe we, we're on our way to success, but we're not there yet. It's taken us six years. Imagine the guy who's come out with a fantastic idea, wants to sell it to an operator, but has problem in getting paid on time, uh, problem paying his, his overheads or whatever. We need some kind of cushion. And that's where investors come in and say, okay, look, what, you know, I'm gonna take a long-term view in Africa, not just a short-term view, and invest behind that entrepreneur for a year, two years, get cash flow positive, and, and, and like you say, you know, help him with business development, help him with financial education, because we're not good at everything. Are you saying that should be the role of the investors or the operators? Uh, investors, operators as well. They, 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 they can contribute a lot to, to enabling uh, one, two-man shows. You know, by giving mentorship advice. I mean, they have everything at their, uh, they have all the tools. Mm -hmm. Andy, what do you think? What should operators be doing? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I've oscillated a little bit on this in my own mind. Um, I've seen uh, operators who I feel get quite involved uh, in terms of, we take M Health as an example. They deploy their own M Health solutions. They, you know, pr procure their own content or their own service providers, and they're very much embedded within the opco. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of other operators who seem to have a very arm's length approach, and they're the, the, the pipe, and everyone else uh, does what they need. Um, I think I'm, I'm not yet made up my mind on what exactly I think works. I think it depends on the operator, and it depends on their skill set, and I think it depends on the environment. So I don't think there's a, a, a role per se, and that's the role you have to play. Um, but in terms of things that I think they definitely can do uh, across the board, um, one of those things would be just to make use of their very, very strong logistics footprint um, to ensure that you can deploy solutions and um, just like if something goes wrong with your, any other feature that you have, if something goes wrong with your mobile payment or something goes wrong with your M Health service, that you can get it s seen to through this kind of very broad network in terms of uh, being able to hand your handset in and getting it upgraded and that sort of thing. So using their existing footprints and their existing assets, uh, but in a new way, that would be something that I think they can definitely do more of uh, and being a little bit more uh, innovative around that. Um, the other thing that I think they could do is make use of their brand to add credibility to some of these uh, more in innovative opportunities that are, that are surfacing. So obviously the operator needs to vet and ensure that the content or the um, solution or service that they're putting their brand behind is, is legitimate. But I think once they've checked that, uh, backing those brands and, and, and using their credibility to, for example, if you're talking about M Health, um, using the brand to make it a, a service that people trust. Mm -hmm. And I think they can go a long way in, uh, in, in doing that. Um, and, and then beyond that, um, I think the operator really has, has uh, a role to play in terms of uh, coordinating the, the ecosystem a little bit because they are seen as the kind of first points of call. 
So by opening themselves up to these partnerships that we've already spoken about at length, um, I know the GSMA is driving the mHealth initiative, they may be driving those initiatives in other sectors as well. I think that gives people a one-stop shop, if you will, uh, a single entry point to engaging with the stakeholders. So I think the operator has quite a role to play because they are the pipe to uh, facilitate other kinds of interactions around that pipe. Okay. Great. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to open this out to, to you in the audience um, now. I do have some more questions, but it, it's your turn now. Um, could we get a mic uh, ready? And perhaps we've got a gentleman here in the, in the center. Is that on now? I really appreciate all the commentary. My, my head is, is swimming and filled with lots of thoughts and questions. I'm not sure I can get them out, so instead I just want to share a little bit of a reaction and then maybe you can respond. My name is Rob Kaufman. I'm coming from the Red Cross, uh, where we have uh, 189 national Red Cross and Red Crescent societies around the world. I manage strategic partnerships and international relations based in Geneva. And Red Cross societies around the world, particularly in Africa, are more and more recognizing the role that economic value creation plays in building a resilient society. With that, they're ready to engage in more innovative partnerships. But you talked about um, how there are people looking, there are people with money looking for deals and people who have ideas looking for money. I think that this is a recurring theme. Certainly, I see it inside the Red Cross. There's sort of like an absence of a, of a business broker culture or mechanism. And because throughout developing countries, uh, sectors have developed largely in silos or are dependent on either public financing and public legitimacy, or they're totally distinct and they're the private sector, and the connections that they make to the public is only at the highest levels at the you know, office of prime minister or something like that. So there, there's just not a lot of cross-fertilization happening at the community level. But yet, we believe that the organizations, not just the Red Cross, but others, can help interpret the ecosystem for organizations and individuals who want to invest but don't know how to translate what they have in these local environments. And the Red Cross and others, NGOs, are often suspicious and skeptical. When you come in, and I really appreciate hearing you guys say you're in it for the money, I think that transparency is essential to building that trust because too often it's perceived as disingenuous. So I, it's just, again, a reflection that there are, there's so much happening, but still in parallel. And I would love to explore mechanisms to facilitate that integration. Any reactions? Hmm? Well, I think it's very cultural. I think raising money is very cultural. Um, you know, um, Stellenbosch in South Africa, a lot of people raising money, but it's kept within that same ecosystem. Not, not a lot of that money is going into Africa. I think uh, what organizations like you guys can help with is, is more cultural uh, awareness and, and maybe, you know, doing what Stellenbosch has done, which, which you would consider would be like the, the closest thing to Silicon Valley, right? Yeah. Um, but there are pockets of it because Stellenbosch may not understand the rest of Africa and, and Kenya and Silicon Valley may not understand Rwanda. Mm -hmm. You know, Africa is 54 countries in one continent, you know, it's so, so fragmented that you're not going to have one kind of strategy that's going to cover everything. So it's going to be very cultural in terms of raising, raising money and awareness. I mean, I, th I think th from what you said, the, the, the thing that shone through for me is just that, that need for partnerships with the, the local organizations on the ground. That's the way we work. Um, all of the projects that, that we undertake are done with partners. Uh, many of them are NGOs, community-based organizations. And um, in my experience, um, they, those organizations have an appetite to, uh, to improve things more, more so than often, and they're prepared to take risks in trying to improve things more so than a public sector entity would. So one thing that I think we've done, which I feel has been quite successful, is we've partnered with those NGOs and those local organizations to get things off the ground and then demonstrated that value to some of the bigger players, like your Department of Health, for example, or Department of Education. And once you can show evidence that these things do work, that's how you can get your scalability. 
Uh, and of course, that money would often then come from the fiscus as opposed to from private donors or uh, even the consumer themselves. But you have to have these business models which kind of have these different phases. And as you move through your, the, your scale or your expansion, your business model needs to be able to change appropriately. So from that perspective, I would definitely say that uh, the uh, organizations such as the Red Cross and others have a very important role to play in terms of proving concepts and trying things and experimenting and being prepared to try new things so that they can demonstrate value that can be taken forward. Yeah, just quickly um, touch on that. I do think that organizations like Red Cross can uh, help with these proof projects or proof of concept projects, and I think that's a great role for um, organizations like the Red Cross to play. I think some of the challenges we've faced is, okay, so they have the risk appetite, and they we can kind of prime the pump with this conversation, but then it's a timing issue because we're, we're trying to move fast and build the business, and then the, the time to deal is a lot longer than, you know, if we're raising millions of dollars with a VC, they'll do it in two to three months. But if we're trying to do 100000 for a proof of concept in X country, it, it takes months with that partner, even though they're, risk, they're ready to do it but it just takes so long. So I, I, I think that's probably the gap right now is it's great that that facilitation can happen and those opportunities to support proof of concept, but if we can find ways to close the timing, um, that, that's gonna be helpful for entrepreneurs like us. And of course your donors need to be open to that as well because at the end of the day, most, of, most organizations, they have to report back, what did you spend the money on? And you have to have how many people did we see? How many communities did we improve? How many lives did we save? Whatever your metrics are. So when you're taking uh, what could be seen as a calculated risk, you're not sure on that return. Um, so it's very, very uh, challenging from that perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Great job, Shit. <laughs> yeah. still awake. I, I just want to, just a beautiful point on that is we've done some work with an organization um, in Kenya around that where they did have some, some money on the side and they, they um, it was sort of an unrestricted grant to us and, and they did it real quickly because um, we asked them to do it quickly. The beautiful thing, though, is they've come back with much bigger, bigger projects now because we've moved so fast. And so they're realizing with these small entrepreneurs, as opposed to giving it to some larger organizations, these, these organizations will move fast, and they, they may not get the full breadth of the data that they expect, but it's you know, getting the data so quickly that it's a thing of, thing of beauty for them. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I think that whole iterative design process really rings true, you know, the lean startup. Um, it's, it's a great concept, and I think lean startups do that better than big companies um, by their very nature. So I think uh, I agree with you. Transparency is key. Knowing what you're getting yourself into, what the expectations of each of the partners is, is, is key. What's going to happen if it succeeds and what's going to happen when it fails? Uh, all very important to, to ensure that uh, you've got the right partner, whatever that may mean. Question. It's a two-part question. Um, remember a couple of years ago, I read an article from an Indian uh, 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 firm, actually, actually from uh, Strategy Plus Business, is uh, uh, how to win under constraint. And you're talking about all the constraint that uh, African businesses are, are facing in terms of, uh, of raising capital. But can you see that at turning it into an opportunity? Because they're playing in a market where the transaction costs need to be so low because of the per capita, the, the reality of the market. So actually being starved of, the, of, um, of capital spur that innovation. They, as you say, to, they need to stretch every single dollar and you know, there is no time to waste. But don't you think in the long term this will be an advantage in the, the mobile and technology market. The second part is, okay, we are asking Silicon Valley, all that, okay, come, invest, invest, but if you look at uh, the money that uh, African have in Western banks, you're talking about a couple hundred million, if not billions of dollars. So if they're not gonna take a bet <laughs> to invest that money in Africa, why should the West and those do? Well, this, you know, we're getting into a whole discussion about leadership here. I mean, I think our, our, our leaders in Africa, we, I mean, bar, bar the country you're from, um, I think they're doing a stellar job. But uh, leadership, leadership is an issue. Because uh, I, 
again, I don't want to talk about this. Uh, maybe it's not the right forum, but the, the culture in Africa is I want to get paid today, right? The, we have to instill a, a thing that, you know, there is long-term vision here. Um, the president himself doesn't know if he's going to be in power tomorrow, right? So what hope does the, the, the people have? They want to make money straight away. And I think uh, uh, we've got to have that mindset where, you know, long-term business is better, long-term vision, investing in long-term. And I think that's how we grow the whole continent. No, not like, you know, just um, thinking about money, making money today at the expense of everything else. I think that's very important. Um, I'd like to agree with your first point wholeheartedly. Um, I think, you know, you go through, through some pretty dark times as an entrepreneur and, you know, you question, are you doing this? For, you know, are, are you going to keep doing this? Um, and what's consistently got us through is the, this kind of um, theory that if we can make it work here, we can make it work anywhere. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're dealing with a, you know, a project where sometimes you're dealing with end users who are hardly literate, there's no money, um, the power, there's no power in the facility to train them in, um, and somehow you manage to rally around and you get it done. Uh, and ultimately, if it works, you know you can take it anywhere. And if it doesn't work, well, at least you, know, you did your best. <laughs> Um, so I definitely think that you know the, the fact that you can build a business and self-fund it, um, we, we did the same thing eight years on, that says to me that we've got something that has value uh, and uh, there's only one way and that's up. So yeah, I, I think if, if you get entrepreneurs and they are able to make it out of Africa, you, you, you have to take your hats off to them. They, they're, they're struggling against quite a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, uh, not, nothing more to, to add on that. I mean, operating in, in a with in a constraint, an environment of constraint, does require the entrepreneur to focus on the things that are most valuable to their end users. In our case, our merchants. And so, I think uh, it's a great organizing principle. Um, it can be scary as a person with a family to have those constraints. However, <laughs> it is great in that it, it creates that that focus, which is important for an entrepreneur. Um, but just more to your second point, also around just the funding and, and where the money comes in. Um, I think there are some good initiatives that are happening. Um, there was a fantastic program in South Africa which was called the Shared Growth Challenge Fund, um, where big business put money towards a fund which was uh, a, a shared uh, investment. So basically, for every rand you put in as the entrepreneur, they'll put in a rand or they'll match your investment. Uh, and I thought that was a great way to get uh, money into fairly high risk but socially oriented initiatives. And I think that sort of uh, um, theory can be applied well in the mobile for development space, that kind of shared risk, uh, where you want to make investments in high risk, the bottom of the pyramid type of uh, situations. And the entrepreneur is also willing, but by matching their investment, you can, you, uh, you, you can get them to take that final step and commit. Great. Thank you. I think we had a question just here. Uh, I'm Adam uh, with Huawei. Um, and there's a really interesting topic, and we're doing a lot of research around this at the moment, so I'm happy to talk to anyone that has interesting ideas um, as we're putting out a report and having some events and things. But I'm interested, I've been doing a lot of traveling recently, talking to people like yourselves doing this kind of work, and I find the challenge with technology is getting to the very last mile, ironically, in that the people that don't use technology, the people that don't use data on their smartphones, for example, they need to learn, oh, maybe I could, maybe there's this great service I don't know about, or I haven't installed it, or I don't know about it, or whatever. And that's a real challenge for many operators. And you say maybe some of these you know, sales points can be helpful. So I'm intrigued as to how we can overcome that last mile challenge to really reach the people at the bottom that can benefit the most in some ways actually from these services. And I think it also links to the question about working with nonprofits to so do often work with some of those people and they have that credibility at stake. Once you start trying to bring a quasi commercial service to people, they've always got it for free before. The schools are free, the health is free, and they're like, would you pay a little bit? It's great. You know, and, then the non-profit is worried about their donors being worried and they're worried about the end user and this credibility issue. And then on the other hand, you have issues like schools that have all these Wi-Fi wi points now that are only able to be used by the schools because the schools don't have the models set up to allow entrepreneurs to use them. And so I'm intrigued as this, you know, it's a great last mile access point potentially. So I'm just interested in your kind of perspectives on this issue. And what does, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, so, so that I see the, the fr that frontline worker as a, as a fantastic tool, uh, and, and that person can be that gateway to the very, very last bottom of the pyramid. Um, so we've, we've focused mostly on that community-based worker, whatever they may be. They may be a teacher, they may be a volunteer, they may be a tribal chief. By getting them on, onto some sort of platform and enabling that platform 
uh, is what we focus on. And I think that's a, that's a good starting point. Uh, it doesn't literally take you into the hands of the very, very end user, but it gets you pretty close. Um, in terms of sustainability and commercializing that, um, I've got so many ideas there. I'd love to chat to you offline. But I think what we need around that are some innovative business models. So um, I'm nervous to take, you know, Department of Health is one of our clients. It's, it's a bit nerve-wracking to go to them and start pitching other ways that a community health worker can generate income to subsidize their stipend from the department. So I think you have to take small steps when you're dealing with public sector, and I, that's why I don't speak for everyone here, but in my experience, you have to first get that base level. They have to see their stats ticking over. They have to see their, their indicators coming through automatically, and then you get the trust, and then you can start to innovate once you have the trust, and it does take time. But that's where I think um, frontline workers can help with the business model, you know, converting them into mobile money agents, selling airtime, whatever the case is, selling products, but also providing a, a service to the community um, and also educating the community about what mobile can do for them. I think they're a fantastic point to focus on. Yeah, I think from our perspective, um, we take a, a product perspective on this, which is, and uh, we haven't gotten good at this, and it, it is an issue for us, which is how do we nudge uh, an SMS or USSD user up, kind of upsell them to the Android app or even to the web app that we have that is, has a much richer suite of tools, um, which will ultimately, we believe, um, or if we've proven, will be good for their business and help them grow and prosper. But um, we, we've, we struggle with that now, is what are the, can we do notifications around just, just marketing to those users about different apps um, that if they were to, to upgrade? but. Um, we, we haven't gotten good results to date, so I, I do think it's a good a, a good challenge for us is is creating compelling nudges to convince them to to upgrade. Um, but it's a, it's it's a good a good challenge for all of us. <laughs> Any other questions? Got a gentleman over here. My name is Sebenez Lasanti from um, MTN. Um, the first one is um, an observation. Uh, I think when it comes to most of the enterprise solutions for payments, we seem to be over-concentrating on Kenya. So maybe it's about time we take the success story beyond Kenya. Because year on year, you come, and it's the same story being rehashed. So um, that is a challenge not only to the operators but also to the entrepreneurs. The success that we've had in Kenya a year from now, how can we talk about more other successes that has also grown and attained scale? That, that is the first observation. The second one is on the, the point um, that was made around building framework um, to enhance partnership between entrepreneurs and operators. Um, it's also important to recognize that the payment, mobile payment world is also getting more and more dynamic. The entrepreneur solution are not also even standard. They are very dynamic and they are changing. Mm -hmm. So even in that space, it's also important to have a dynamic framework to be able to accommodate many different facets of solutions coming from the entrepreneurs and doing that also in an ent entrepreneurial way. Um, so again, how do you put down a standard framework to accommodate highly dynamic solutions coming from many different um, entrepreneurs? It's, it's a challenge. Um, maybe there can be you know, some general guidelines, but it's going to be very difficult to be able to provide a framework for distribution, say, um, for almost every possible um, um, solution coming from, from the entrepreneurs. So it's the second um, observation that, that I'm, I, I just want to make. I don't know if there is any response. Otherwise, it's just an observation, not necessarily a question. Well, I'll make a, a quick prediction. I'll get in trouble for this from the, my company. But uh, I think a year from now, uh, if the GSMA would like to, they can invite me on to a panel and I, we can talk about merchant payments 
and I will never use the word Kenya. We have now four deals um, in other markets. Um, they're early stages, but they're very promising deals, and in some cases they're, they're with um, MTN. And we believe that what we're building with our partners, um, the telcos, will be uh, – will scale and we'll, we can talk about an exciting, dynamic merchant ecosystem and we'll never use the word Kenya. Um, so that's my prediction. Um, I'm going to get in trouble for this, but that's why we're, building, we're scaling our business. So I, I think that's going to happen. Um, I do think your second point, the dynamic framework, that's true. Um, I mean, we change our, uh, the way we like to interface with our partners. The operators are changing their mobile money systems and all of this. So it does need to be um, we have to recognize that it needs to be dynamic, but the only way to do that is to start that, first of all, have an appetite for a dynamic framework, and so that then start conversations around what that, what that looks like. And I, it's very refreshing that, for example, um, m -Pace says about the upgrade, um, here I am using Kenya, but uh, a lot of the platforms are now have APIs. For, in the case of Kenya, which is, this is not a good point for Kenya, they had, we had to use web crawlers for many years to interface with their system, not an API. So that is actually many years behind other operators in Africa that actually have web services APIs that are a lot easier for us to integrate with. So there is an example of where other markets are much ahead of Kenya. Now it's going to change pretty quickly, but uh, that's, I think that's an API is a good example of a dynamic framework that helps entrepreneurs. Any further reactions? While we're, while we're looking to the future, I have a question. Um, we've, we've talked about the number of um, M4D services that have been launched. Um, they may not have scaled yet. Um, we've gone through sort of at least five years of product development in, in, in this space and, and probably longer. What do you think the next generation of M4D services will look like or what will be important? I think the user experience. Yeah. It's definitely all about the user experience. The handset today, my phone looks like an iPhone, looks like a Samsung. It's not really about the hardware anymore. It's what that tool, and it is a tool. Uh, for us, it's a mobile lifestyle tool. It's a time management tool. And it's going to, that, wh whatever's on that handset, um, you know, to the average African consumer, the world is not round. It's a four-inch screen. That's their window to the world. They're going to do everything through that screen. Relevant life tools and basically making people more productive. When you're more productive, you make more money, you, may, you are more happy. And ultimately, that's what Africa's, that's what our aim is to make Africa a happy continent. So I think, and the youth, uh, you know, 60% of the population is youth. So the message, uh, the growth is coming from the youth, tailor, make, give relevant content to the youth. You know, um, we do a lot of our stuff through emotional attachment to the brand. So we focus a lot on music, fashion, uh, uh, you know, uh, social media, because that's, that's the future. Uh, the guy, the 16-year-old guy today who's buying a MyPhone, I want to have his business when he's 20 and he gets his first job. I want him to upgrade to another MyPhone. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, we've got a challenge as well, uh, is to keep that user experience consistent and getting better and better. Um, so the characteristics of M4D services, um, I think I'm hopeful that, um, that you're going to see a lot more interoperability. Uh, in these services, I think we've we've seen this proliferation of tens of thousands of M4D apps, which have been built with a kind of a single intervention in mind, like this is for TB, or this is for HIV, or this is for mobile money. And I'm hoping that we're going to start seeing these coalesce into something a bit more uh, coherent. Um, so that could be through APIs, it could be, but it, it needs to be more than just technical integration. It needs to be more conceptual. Um, so it's going to mean partners working together who perhaps have multi sectoral focus, focus or foci, um, and working together towards a common, a common goal. So interoperability and, uh, and an ecosystem initiative is one of the things. Um, I, I obviously looking at, depending on what your time frame is for this question, um, I do think you're obviously going to see the, the disappearance of your feature phone and your, and your dumb phone. And I think it's going to have a significant impact in the, the, the richness of the services that you're going to be able to deliver and being able to, to deliver them offline and online uh, at the same uh, time. Um, and then I th the final innovation, I think, is going to be around the business models. And we're going to start seeing um, some very, very innovative business models around uh, M4D services, uh, co-payments, um, advertising versus you know, traditional micropayments and so on. So I think we're going to see these blended revenue models coming through as well.
Yeah, I think the, 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 the nature of the conversation will change from, let's not talk about bridging the digital divide. I think a lot of us are now extending the products to the, the last mile. Um, I, but but the, the, the focus of M4D projects will then be not around providing access, but providing utilization, getting good utilization rates. And it's going to be some combination of good, exper good uh, user experience, good partnerships. And that's really where we're going to have to be focusing now is once we all accept that we need to bridge that digital divide, now how do we get people to actually use that bridge that we've built? I think that's a great note to end on. Um, thank you very much um, to, to all three of you. I think it's come through very strongly the importance of brokering partnerships, of enabling um, the ecosystem to interact with operators and all of the other players in that ecosystem will be key over the next two, three, five, ten years. I didn't specify the, the, the time frame there, um, the future. I would just like to highlight before we close to everyone here that if you would like to see some of the products and services um, that have been mentioned today, uh, Mabenzi Smart Health app, um, the Copo Copo Merchant Payments um, products, as well as the World Readers that were, were mentioned earlier today, um, please do join us in the GSMA Innovation City. It's in Hall, hall 3. So if you have any spare time over the next uh, few days, please take a tour around the Innovation City and you can see these products for yourself. We'd also be thrilled to continue the conversation with you tonight. Um, we have a networking reception this evening uh, at 7 o'clock, 7 till 9 p.m., uh, in the Manila Room at Hotel 1898, which is on La Rambla. Um, we do have a number of other m seminar events. I wonder if we could flick to the slide, which gives details of that. Some more. There we go. So we'll leave that up uh, as, as you will leave the, the room so that you can see what else is going on with the M4D department. But for now, please join me in thanking my panelists today.